My name is Michael Mithakrishna, and I'm an Associate Professor of Economic Psychology at the London School of Economics. My research focuses on how humans evolve, the ways in which we're different and similar to other animals, what that tells us about the world today, including how culture, this body of information, evolves over time, and then what we can do with that information to address some of the, to me, the most pressing social problems uh, of our age and the kind of pressing social problems that we really need to solve in the, in the coming decades. The big question that I'm interested in is what affects our level of intelligence as individuals and as a society? It's a controversial question. Let's start with what most people think. It's this thing. We've got brains and they're huge, three times as large as the chimps and three times as large as our ancestors just a few million years ago. So large that we have to fold our skulls to birth them. And so naturally, a lot of the focus has been on unraveling the mysteries of this impressive hardware. And you might think that a bigger brain is always going to be better, but if you do, you should wonder why more animals don't have enormous brains. Part of the answer is that brain tissue is energetically expensive. Big brains let you store, manage, and process more information, but you have to pay the energy bills. You have to be able to reliably find enough food to feed those big hungry brains. And while today we produce more than enough calories to feed the world, even if it's not equitably distributed, for most of our history, and for most animals even today, much of our day was spent searching for food. And yet, we do have these giant brains. For humans, more and more evidence suggests that if you want to understand our intelligence, you need to understand both the hardware and the software. The hardware does matter. Pollution, disease, lead in the water, insufficient nutrition, exposure to smoking, all of these are examples of things that harm our body's ability to build good brains. But we're a little different to other animals. When most animals encounter a new environment, they're forced to genetically adapt powerful muscles to outrun local predators, fur and fat to keep from freezing, proteins to make plants less poisonous. But genetically, humans changed very little. There were, of course, some adaptations, skin color, for example, to optimize vitamin D synthesis and minimize skin cancer as a function of latitude, how much UV radiation there is. If you're dark skinned in Europe, you need to take vitamin D supplements. If you're light skinned in Australia, slap on some sunscreen. There are other examples like uh, our ability to process various foods, uh, lactose being a prominent example, uh, to protect against disease like malaria, genetic adaptations to altitude, and so on. But there is more genetic difference between two groups of chimpanzees in Africa than two groups of humans plucked from Europe and Asia. So unlike most animals, when we encountered a new env uh, environment, we figured out how to handle it with our software the stuff that's running on our brains. We didn't just evade the local predators, we hunted them. We didn't evolve fat and fur, we wore the pelts of our prey. We didn't process the poisons in our bodies, we processed the plants before we ate them. So for humans, that shifts the question of intelligence to how did that software get written? Now, some of it was individually learned. Think reinforcement learning. Touch a hot ember, it burns, don't do that again. Eat a tasty mango, it's yummy, so find some more. And some of it was genetic. We like sweet foods over bitter foods. We love some good gossip and we might even be instinctively drawn to fire. But a lot of what we need to survive is not genetic or individually learned. We require cooked food, for example, to feed those hungry brains. But as many of you know, we have no instincts for how to cook or even how to create a fire. A lot of that software is vicariously acquired. We conquered every ecosystem by developing tools, techniques, and traditions, beliefs, values, and norms, mental tools like counting. Many societies have a number system that only explicitly counts one, two, three, and then many. Uh, we have mental tools that have developed over cultural time, like if P then Q reasoning, which populations that don't have access to formal education can't seem to instinctively handle. And even just learning how to learn, how to, how to focus, or what to focus on. That body of knowledge, what we call culture, has been expanding in our species beyond the capacity of even the smartest among us. And so many of the features of our society are designed to handle that ever-growing body of knowledge. We grew our brains to the point that we have difficulty birthing them. Even today, unplanned birth interventions like emergency cesareans or forceps, so these are unplanned interventions, are predicted by head size rather than body size. 
Uh, we did other things like we extended our juvenile period to, so that we could spend more time learning. And we've continued to do that culturally. We have a cultural adolescence. So think back to the period when you could actually reproduce and when you actually do. And you can see that that period has been expanding to the point where we now spend the first 20 to 30 years catching up on the last several thousand years of human history. We specialized, so we divided up the knowledge and the labor. Uh, if a population is large enough, we can all go further by only learning a part of that knowledge base and getting really good at it. So if you imagine in a small town, you might have one general physician. In a large city, a physician might specialize on one small part of the renal system, which they got really, really good at. Understanding this, what we call the cultural brain hypothesis, shifts the focus of inquiry for human intelligence. The answer is not in our cells, it's in our societies. So what does this give us? Well, it means that we can start to understand the levers of intelligence, both collective and individual. Let's start with the collective. There are three main classes of levers that have been identified. The first of these is what we call sociality, which is the size and the interconnectedness of our societies. You can imagine technologies from agriculture to the internet that have expanded both of these. So the innovations themselves feed back to support larger, smarter, more interconnected populations. And with those larger, smarter, more interconnected populations, you have more models to learn from, more ideas to recombine into, into new innovations and so on. As a stylized example, Imagine that we maxed out a brain size 10 units. You can't birth anything bigger than that. But you still have to, and in a small scale society, you have to know how to do everything that it takes to survive. You personally have to know those things. Forget about figuring it out. You just need to know these things, right? Let's say there's 10 things, food, housing, shelter, clothes, the rules of society, defense, and so on, right? 10 brain units, 10 things to learn. You can reach skill level one. And as a society, we have all reached a mean of skill level one. Imagine you only had to learn half of those things because there are enough other people that even if some of them die, you know there's enough people who know the other half reliably. You'll get those things. Now you can dedicate those 10 brain units to getting better at those five things and you can now reach skill unit two, right? Skill level two as a society. But imagine you only need to learn one thing. There's enough other people out there to do the nine other things. So now we as a society can reach skill level 10 divided further and the sky's the limit despite that limited 10 size brain. Now, it does mean more silos, of course, it means that the knowledge is more segregated, but that's for another lecture. The next lever is transmission fidelity, how well you can transmit the information from person to person and generation to generation. If you can more efficiently deliver the package of knowledge, you can learn it faster, more efficiently, and you can learn more. You can see this development in the history of teaching. In, in many hunter-gatherer societies, there's really not a lot of teaching going on. You just kind of let the kids hang around and they watch and they learn in that way. Pastoralists might do a little bit more deliberate instruction. There might be more to learn. When there's more to learn, we might spend more time actually teaching children. And when the Industrial Revolution kicked off, we needed compulsory formal education. Sit down, kids. We're going to teach you all of the things that you need to know to be a functional member of our society, and we're going to do it systematically and efficiently. Let's go phonemes, numbers, writing, and so on. Today, as the world becomes more complex, educational in innovations are, are constantly trying harder and harder to pack in more earlier and more easily. The third lever is the most difficult, tolerance for diversity. On the one hand, diversity is the fuel for the engine of innovation. More ideas to recombine into new things, more ability to adapt to new circumstances what we might call evolvability or adaptability. So not just that you are adapted to the current circumstances, but that you have the capacity to evolve to brand new circumstances. Someone out there in your society has the answers for a new problem or people out there. Think elliptical curves and cryptography in the age of the internet, or uh, all of those epidemiologists that we are so grateful to right now. But on the other hand, diversity is by definition divisive. It makes it more difficult to communicate for one. And if you can't communicate easily, then those lines of idea flow in our social networks get broken down and you don't get that recombinatorial effect. Figuring out the balance between these is, is the challenge. Now, but we solve problems as a collective and these levers make our collective brain smarter. 
But as the new skills and knowledge diffuse through the population, each of us gets smarter too. A smarter collective brain makes each of their constituent cultural brains cleverer in this kind of feedback loop. So from this perspective, individual intelligence and IQ becomes a proxy for those mental tools that you've learned, a proxy for cultural complexity, with IQ tests measuring what your society thinks is most useful. So it's not so much that a culture-free IQ test makes little sense, it's that a, the culture-free IQ makes little sense for a species as dependent on cultural knowledge as we are. And so then all of those facts about IQ shouldn't surprise you at all. It shouldn't surprise you that IQ predicts school and work performance in weird, that is Western educated industrialized rich democratic societies, or that IQ test results are most predictive of jobs that are classified as high in information processing compared to, to low in information processing, or that educational interventions can raise IQ, uh, or that there are differences between groups over time. So the Flynn effect, take the Flynn effect as one example. The rise in IQ over generations taken at face value would render past generations barely functional. So that, that can't be right. But if instead IQ is this reflection or that the Flynn effect is driven by this increase in cultural complexity, then it makes a lot more sense. So widening, it, widening education, better pedagogy, uh, more complex media. Think of the TV shows from the 60s and 70s versus TV shows today, right? Adam West Batman versus The Dark Knight. I Love Lucy versus Rick and Morty, Christopher Reeve's Superman versus Avengers Endgame. You get the point. So from this perspective, because of the homogenizing effect of cultural evolution on the environment, we're, we're likely overestimating genetic heritability. So our heritability estimates are probably overestimated because cultural evolution has shrunk the variability in the environment, but continues to grow and shrink uh, through these cultural evolutionary forces as new things are invented and as they diffuse. So that means that genetic heritability as an estimate is less a, a function of a trait to be discovered and more this kind of moving target that is subject to these cultural evolutionary forces. Now, I just wanna emphasize that none of this is to say that individuals aren't important. You're not going to get us to a COVID vaccine if you're working in civil engineering, but we solve problems as a collective. Simultaneous invention is the norm in science. Darwin and Wallace both discovered natural selection. Newton and Leibniz both created the calculus. And even if you think your ideas as a scientist are unique and brilliant, you still fear being scooped, which you really shouldn't if they really are that unique and really are that individually brilliant. Now, on the other hand, it was only Darwin and Wallace and, and maybe a handful of others. It was only Newton and Leibniz. Reconciling why that is will need more time. And I am running out of time. So let me end with this. Sometimes what it takes for science to move forward is to let go of assumptions, assumptions that just seem so obvious. The earth, for example, looks pretty flat and our eyes can clearly see a sun tracing the sky from east to west. But when we let go of that assumption, we get a better model of the solar system. Time feels like it ought to flow the same for all people in all places. But when we let go of that assumption, we get a better model of the universe. The biological world looks pretty chaotic and humans clearly set apart. But when we let go of that assumption, we get a better model of nature. The seemingly obvious assumption that I think holds back the human and social sciences is the assumption of human intelligence. It's not that we're not bright, we are. But not in the ways you think we are and not for the reasons you think we are. When we let go of that assumption, we get a better model of ourselves and our society. 